There are moments in history where something appears that doesn't just feel advanced for its time. It feels out of place. Not ahead of its era in a gradual way, but disconnected from the timeline entirely, as if it belongs to a different version of Earth. Most people assume ancient history is simple. That progress moves in a straight line. That intelligence slowly climbs upward from caves to cities to machines. But that assumption only works if you ignore the evidence that refuses to fit. Because scattered across the planet are discoveries that don't behave like accidents, don't follow expected evolution, and don't leave descendants. Systems that regulate themselves. Designs that appear fully formed. Knowledge that arrives without a visible learning curve. And the uncomfortable part is this. Each one on its own can be explained away. But when you line them up, across different continents, different eras, different cultures, they start to tell a very different story. A story where Earth didn't just host intelligence once. And where human history may not be the first chapter, it may be a continuation. Imagine standing on Earth 1.7 billion years ago, at a time when the planet is silent in a way we can barely comprehend, because there are no forests, no animals, no insects, and no signs of anything that even resembles intelligence as we know it, just rock, water, and slow geological time. Now imagine that somewhere beneath your feet, the Earth switches something on. Not metaphorically, not symbolically, but physically, as uranium atoms begin splitting in a sustained chain reaction, releasing energy in a controlled way that today we associate only with nuclear power plants built by advanced civilizations. This place is called Oklo, and the reason scientists noticed it at all is because something about the uranium there was wrong. When researchers examined the ore, they expected to find a natural balance of radioactive isotopes, the kind produced by random decay over immense spans of time, but instead they found clear evidence that specific isotopes had been used up, consumed selectively, in the same way fuel is consumed inside a working reactor. That alone was strange, but the deeper they looked, the stranger it became. The reaction at Oklo did not simply flare up and burn out in chaos. Evidence shows that it turned on, shut itself down, cooled, and then restarted again, repeating this cycle over and over, almost as if the planet itself were regulating the process. Water seeped into the uranium, slowed the neutrons, allowed fission to occur, then boiled away as temperatures rose, shutting the reaction down, only for the entire system to reset once conditions stabilized again. That is not how we normally think geology behaves. That is how systems behave. Even more unsettling is what happened afterward, because nuclear reactions produce waste that is notoriously difficult to contain, yet at Oklo those byproducts stayed almost exactly where they were created, locked inside the rock for nearly two billion years without spreading, leaking, or poisoning the surrounding environment. Modern engineers struggle to design containment systems that can last a fraction of that time. Here, it happened without steel walls, without concrete shielding, without any visible machine at all. Which leads to the quiet question at the center of Oklo. If you removed the labels, ignored the assumptions, and judged only by behavior, would you call this a natural accident? Or would you call it a reactor that happened to be made of stone instead of metal? Imagine this for a moment. You are standing in the Bronze Age, a world of leather shields, exposed limbs, and simple protection, where survival depends more on agility than engineering, and then suddenly, in front of you, stands a warrior who looks like he stepped out of the wrong timeline. His entire body is sealed in bronze. Not wrapped, not draped, but enclosed. Plates overlap with precision, joints bend where the human body bends, and the weight of the armor is distributed so evenly that it doesn't crush the person inside it something that even modern designers struggle to achieve when building mechanical exoskeletons. This is the Dendra Panoply. And the first strange thought that crosses your mind is this. Who taught them this? Because this does not look like an invention that slowly emerged from trial and error. It looks like a design that already understood anatomy, balance, and motion before it was ever worn. If you didn't know its age, you might think it was inspired by something else, by a future idea, or by technology seen rather than invented, the kind of thing someone might design after witnessing advanced armor and trying to recreate it with the materials they had. And that's where the imagination starts to wander. Was this an experiment that came from a moment of insight we never recorded? Or was it something stranger, like knowledge carried backward, the way time travel stories imagine? One glimpse of something advanced, leaving a single object behind before the door closed again. Or, if you allow yourself to entertain it for just a second, 
Does it resemble the way science fiction imagines alien technology adapted clumsily to human bodies, rigid, protective, overbuilt, designed with function in mind rather than tradition? The most unsettling part is what happens next. Nothing. There are no earlier versions leading up to it, no half-formed attempts, no visible progression, and after it appears, history does not continue the idea. Instead, armor becomes simpler, lighter, and less protective, as if this design was never meant to be part of the timeline at all. It's like finding a single frame from a movie that was never filmed. Technology normally spreads. Good ideas are copied. Effective designs leave descendants. But the Dendra panoply leaves none, which makes it feel less like a local invention and more like a foreign concept, briefly intersecting with history before vanishing, leaving behind only one impossible question. Was this armor invented here, or was it remembered? 70,000 years ago, a human steps into a cave in southern Africa, carrying materials that, on their own, don't look unusual. Bits of ochre, plant matter, stone tools, animal fat. But what happens next inside Sabudu Cave is where the familiar picture of early humans quietly breaks down. Because nothing here is random. The materials are brought in specific combinations, prepared in a particular order, heated at controlled temperatures, and then mixed together using containers that are reused again and again, forming a sequence of actions that looks far less like experimentation and far more like procedure. This isn't someone trying things out to see what works. This is someone following steps. Evidence shows that substances were ground, heated, cooled, and combined with binders to produce compounds that had predictable properties, meaning the person doing the work already knew what the outcome was supposed to be before the process even began. Input, transformation, output, and then the cycle repeats. What's unsettling is how early this happens. This is tens of thousands of years before agriculture, before cities, before metallurgy. Yet the behavior inside this cave already resembles something we associate with workshops and laboratories, not survival camps. Fire is not used simply for warmth or cooking. It's used as a tool, applied carefully to change materials in controlled ways. Containers aren't just storage. They're part of the process. And the same sequences appear again and again, which means the knowledge wasn't improvised on the spot, but retained, repeated, and passed forward. At some point, the question stops being how did they discover this, and becomes why does this feel so organized? Because humans learning through trial and error leave behind mess. Failed attempts, abandoned mixtures, inconsistent results, but Sabudu Cave shows consistency, as if the people working there were executing instructions rather than inventing them. It feels less like a moment of discovery and more like maintenance, the continuation of a method that already existed. And that introduces a disturbing possibility. If humans at this stage were capable of carrying out complex chemical processes without fully understanding the underlying principles, then where did the structure of those processes come from? Because systems don't appear fully formed unless someone designs them or someone inherits them. Sabudu Cave doesn't look like the birthplace of industrial thinking. It looks like a place where humans stepped into a role performing actions that worked without necessarily knowing why they worked like operators inside a system that had been established earlier. The first thing uncovered at Sank Singdui wasn't immediately recognizable as anything familiar, because what emerged from the ground had a face, but not one that made sense in a human way, with eyes that pushed outward far beyond the skull, ears that stretched wider than any head should allow, and proportions that felt measured rather than exaggerated, as if the scale had been chosen deliberately instead of symbolically. At first, it isn't even obvious what you're looking at. Only after spending time with it do archaeologists label it a mask, though the word feels insufficient because it doesn't sit on a human face, doesn't align with human features, and doesn't seem designed for human comfort or expression at all. As more objects are uncovered, the pattern becomes harder to ignore. These artifacts are not carved loosely or artistically. Many appear assembled, built from multiple bronze components that align precisely, suggesting modular construction and functional intent, as if these were parts meant to work together rather than decorative pieces meant to be admired. Everything feels finished. At some point, the question naturally shifts, and this is where the discomfort truly settles in. Instead of asking what these objects represent, you start asking who they were meant for, because the proportions don't feel symbolic, ceremonial, or exaggerated for effect. They feel practical, scaled deliberately, but not to human anatomy. This opens a possibility that is rarely spoken out loud. 
that what existed here may not have been a human civilization that simply looked different, but a form of organized intelligence that did not share our physical form, our proportions, or our way of interacting with the world. Not mythical beings, not monsters, but a civilization that was fundamentally not like us, leaving behind objects that reflect that difference in quiet, unmistakable ways. What makes this even more unsettling is how these artifacts were buried. They were not destroyed, not scattered, and not abandoned in chaos, but placed deliberately into the ground, as if a system was being closed down rather than a society collapsing. The Dashka stone does not announce itself as something strange when you first hear about it, because a carved stone slab sounds ordinary enough, especially in the context of ancient history, where carving information into rock was one of the few ways knowledge could survive time. But the moment you start following its surface with your eyes, you realize that the land on it is not being described the way land usually is by people who live on it. Rivers don't appear as places to cross or follow, but as complete systems, stretching from their origins to their endpoints without interruption, while elevations rise and fall smoothly across the slab, connected to everything around them, as if distance and movement were irrelevant to whoever laid this out. At some point, a single thought naturally slips in, almost uninvited, and it doesn't need repeating once it arrives. This is what the land looks like when you are not standing on it. The stone presents terrain the way it would appear to someone who wasn't walking through valleys or climbing hills, but seeing everything at once, the way we only learned to do recently by leaving the ground entirely, by rising into the sky, into the atmosphere, and eventually into space itself. After that realization, the rest of the stone quietly falls into place. It behaves like a planning surface, the kind of thing you would create if you were studying Earth from a distance and needed a permanent way to record how the land was arranged before memory, language, or even the people using it changed. What makes the Dashka stone unsettling isn't that it invites wild explanations, but that it makes ordinary ones feel insufficient, because ancient humans mapped what they could reach, while this slab maps what they could never physically see in its entirety. And once that idea settles in, you don't keep thinking about who carved it. You start wondering how many times Earth has been seen from above before we ever learned how to look up.